So what's your takeaway from the hospice job? If you took one thing away from the hospice job, what would it be? I think it is that you let the patient guide you what they want. We have a tendency with loved ones to make them feel better, to make them get well. And oftentimes, our loved one's ready to go. Always, I think. Yes. They're almost begging. Yes. And for, I don't, I can't say the quote that you started the show with, which was wonderful, but to listen to them, they'll tell you, they'll tell you what they want. And, you know, some of my most wonderful experiences was I went into a lady's room and she probably had three or four days. And I said, what do you want? What do you want? And she said, I really want to go zip lining. And I said, then you know what, honey? I'll be back here tomorrow morning. We'll go zip lining. No, that is not true. That is true. In a wheelchair? Did you zip line in no, a wheelchair? No, she was not in a wheelchair. She was not in a wheelchair. She was with her nurses. The nurses went with us, and we went zip lining. Strapped and her in. Strapped her in. And she said it was the happiest day of her life. And that's what she wanted to do, where her daughter was over there saying, Mom, if you do that, you could die. And she said, I'm dying mm. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she said, let me go. And so it was a wonderful day for all of us. Wow, that's a good story. All right, let's move on to 2011. You founded Pause in Prison. I read a little bit about this, how you were working at hospice, and you read about a man who wanted his last meal. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Tell that story. Well, I wasn't working in hospice. Oh, I, was just, I, was a, I just moved to Little Rock, and there were three men that this has been about 25 years ago, that were being executed at the same time. And Mara Leverett wrote an article about one of the men, and his name was um, Leverett, I mean, Hoyt Kleins. And he wanted a hamburger, french fries, and banana bread, and the article just said, the kitchen didn't make banana bread. And as you know, Carrie, I'm not a good cook. And Mm -hmm. I thought, I can take him some banana bread. And so the next day I made some banana bread and took it down to him. And, of course, they wouldn't give it to him because they said they needed to protect him, protect him so that they could euthanize him the next day, I suppose. Anyway, I did get the banana bread to him through the warden, and he called me that night. And we talked for 48 minutes. And um, that's when I became involved with the prison. So it's been about 30 years ago. And how did pause for prison pause in prison come about well his last wish to me was that i would build a chapel at tecker max and so it took me 15 years to build the chapel at tecker max which meant i was there a lot watching these men these brilliant you'll see when you talk to them these brilliant men they don't have anything to do all day and so i kept looking for things to do and then you all remember um what was the football player's name that had all the Pit Bulldogs, uh, oh, Michael, Michael Vick. Michael Vick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they sentenced his 52 Pit Bulldogs to be euthanized. And a prison from Virginia petitioned the governor, give us those dogs and let us through intense behavior modification, train them. The end of the story was 48 of them went on to be adopted by children and three of them went on to be service dogs. And so I was on the first plane out there. And I knew, and then it took me three years to convince Bibi that that's what we should put into our prisons. And we've saved to date, I think we're at 1,872 dogs. Wow. And not to mention, you know, what it does to the inmates. So that's how it all happened. Yeah, it's in six facilities. I think I read you're in six. We've got pause in prison in six facilities. Six facilities. Uh, you've reduced the number of dogs euthanized. Inmates are contributing and feel worthy. Oh. And uh, learning responsibility and skills that I guess can be used later. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We're talking with Rennie Rule about her life in social work, nonprofit, and all the great things she's done through UAMS, SCAN, Hospice, Arkansas Hospice, and Pause in Prison. And with her, she brought Mr. Charlie Mack, who, along with other felons and past gang members, has started a program called Empowering Your Environment. Empowering my environment. Oh, yep. Empowering my environment. Before you tell us about this initiative, Mr. Mack, tell us about your life, what you were convicted of, and the story that led up to the events. 
Where do you want to begin? No, no, it's kind of. What kinda were you general? Con- it's kind of vague. Where, where were you? What were you convicted of? Um, possession of a controlled substance. How old were you? Mm, how many? Which time? First time. Uh, probably eighteen, but that wasn't. That was um, just had a. I had a gun. Oh. I got caught with a gun, and I've been caught with guns. You know, because this in, in the streets you have to. It's better to have be judged by twelve than carried by six. So that means it's better to have a gun and go to and go to prison than be killed. You rather you rather be alive and be in prison than dead. Why are black men killing each other? I think it's um, poverty. I think I think poverty is the main thing. Everyone wants to take care of their family. Why Every, would killing somebody else take care of your family? But it's not. It's, it, it, I'm going to explain okay. it to you. It's a, it's a process. Because uh-huh. poverty is embedded in our community. So you grow up wanting more and more. And to get more, you think you have to take it. So that's where the violence comes in. That's where the killing comes in. Because if you if you take something from somebody, who who's going to let you just take it from them? Somebody's going to say, no, that's mine, you know? So it, it turns into a violent situation. But it's the violence and the killing is connected with poverty. It's all connected. Because... Okay, you go to certain neighborhoods in the city, in Little Rock. There's not a lot of violence in their community. There's not a lot of, because the community is fluent, it's affluent. It has wealth. There's no reason to be, to for somebody to take something from somebody in that community. But because if everybody's people, poor, you're just taking from each other nothing. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the mindset. Oh, it's the mindset. It's the mindset. Thing. You have to think outside of that environment. That's why we named our business Empowering My Environment. Because your environment starts with your mindset, how you think. Not just where you live or where you reside, but first of all, you have to reside in your mind. You have to think things and, and think things through. And, and and if you see yourself in a bad situation and think that's all you know, then you're going to continue doing those wrong things. But if you change your mindset, if you get a focus point in your life of where you want to change and you want to see things better, then your mindset changes and it changes your environment as well. Because That's such a huge thing to do is to change people's minds and change a whole community. I mean, where do you get the uh, the where for all to f- and how to even begin doing because something? Because I have to start myself. It starts with me. But it you're teaching with, it through your empowering. We, we starting it together, my brothers, uh, Charlie Rock, uh, Turtle, and, and Caleb. We we we're, we changed our lives. We we pulled ourselves up from the bootstraps through support, through a higher power, through religion. However, we did it. We found a way to get out of that that mindset thinking of, of doing things that is detrimental to others and ourselves. And once we started doing that, our whole worlds changed. We started becoming involved with allies like Miss Rennie and Paul, and and we started becoming more involved with our neighborhood. And and people in our neighborhood became started respecting us more. They don't see us as the gang member, the guy, the, that young boy I seen with that gun last week. No, nah, you're not him anymore. You're the guy that talks to their children and tell them, man, don't do that. I've done that before. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the picture of Carrie's face in the center of the screen. To watch the full-length interview, click the video in the top right. For more interview highlights, click the video in the bottom right. Thank you for watching.